Africa's top football clubs are in action in various parts of the continent this weekend. This week on Matchpoint, we look at how Egyptian teams are faring. Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's edition of Matchpoint, the program that brings you African sports news features and highlights from across the continent and beyond. I'm Mahia Mutua, also coming up in this edition. Uganda qualifies for Rugby Africa Tier 1A, replacing relegated Tunisia. And Senegalese traditional wrestlers hold light training sessions during Ramadan. Well, let's first begin at Wimbledon, where Serena Williams has claimed a sixth Wimbledon title and fourth successive Grand Slam crown by defeating 20th seeded Spaniard Gabriña Muguruza to win Saturday's final 6-4-6-4. American Williams reinforced her stranglehold on the women's game by overcoming an early setback and resisting a fight back to claim a 21st Grand Slam title after losing a close first set and battling bravely to come back from 5-1 down in the second. The Spaniard was eventually downed after one hour and 23 minutes to hand Williams the acclaim of the center court crowd. Williams now holds all four majors at the same time, a phenomenon dubbed the Serena Slam having also won the U.S., Australian and French Open titles. Thank you so much. Ms. Williams. Turning now to football, Algerian club side ES Setif trained on Friday ahead of their meeting with compatriot hosts MCL Yulma in match day two in Group B of the CAF Champions League. The match is set for a late kickoff with most players and fans observing fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. Both teams will be hoping to make amends after registering losses in the first round of action. The title holder Setif lost 2-1 at home against fellow Algerian side USM Alger, while their Saturday opponents lost by the same scoreline in Sudan. Visitors Setif remained upbeat about their away match against the hosts who were relegated to the Algerian second division this year. We are again playing an African match on a Ramadan night. Yes, Satif is used to playing under such circumstances. We hope to utilize our experience to win the match and the matches that follow, God willing. There are three Algerian teams competing in the group of eight stage of the CAF Champions League. It is not the first time that three teams from the same country play in the group stage. It means that we will play most of our matches here. We have five matches to play in Algeria. It's good for Algerian football that three teams are playing in CAF Champions League quarterfinals. We hope that two teams will qualify for the semis. All right, now joining us live from Cairo is CCTV's Adel Mahrui. Uh, Adel, first of all, Egypt has only one team this year at this stage of the Champions League, that is Smuha. Uh, uh, they are making their debut at this stage of the competition. Uh, looking at how they've been playing in the domestic league, what would you say their prospects in Africa are? I would definitely say it's a surprise, and that's what many have been seeing it here in Egypt, that Sumoha ranking the ninth in the Egyptian Premier League uh, and in sometimes um, threatened to go in a lower position um, would be struggling in Egypt. However, it has become this year the most successful team in the Africans Champion League. We know that both Al Ahli and Al Zamalek have dropped down from the Champions League to the Federation Cup. So it means that um, in an African perspective, Sumoha has been the strongest team performing uh, in an African competition or in the Champions League in particular. Um, now it seems that the, the club has been preparing for some time. They have traveled um, uh, from um, Egypt to have a quick um, camp before um, their game uh, and up until today a day ahead of the game it seems that more or less the team's formation is stable they have only one injury that they already knew before um, one player midfielder um, have been um, the, the the coach have disqualified him from um, the team formation because he missed the last training in Egypt uh, for no specific reason. So he um, didn't include him in the final um, team formation that will be um, joining uh, Al-Sumoh as one of the most critical 
um, games uh, for it uh, uh, on Sunday. At the same time, um, in its group, Samoa is on top of the group. Uh, Samoa is leading its group in the African Champions League. So by far, there's a very big gap between its performance in Egypt and in Africa. And it seems that the Alexandrian team is focused to have some solid performance in its first experience in the Champions League. Well, Adele, you did mention uh, Zamalek and Al Ahli. Talking now about the Confederations Cup, it does seem that Egypt has a better representation there. Just to give us an update, Zamalek uh, did win their tie today against Orlando Pirates, and Al Ahli play tomorrow against Stad Malia. How important is it, talking about Al Ahli, for uh, the Red Devils to maintain their winning ways after they won against Tunisia EST? It's extremely important. Al Ahli uh, has had a tough uh, time. There is a lot of turbulence that has been going on. Um, they have changed their own um, coach, uh, the Spaniard, the Carlos Garrido, moving back to Fatih Mabrouk, one of the old, always a very strong backup. A manager that always whenever there is a foreign coach who steps down or being uh, sacked from his position Fakhim Abruk always steps in and leads the team to quite an amazing success stories however also again Fakhim Abruk has just um, learned um, um, maybe 10 days ago or two weeks ago that he will not be continuing with the Red Devils so again some management turbulences for Al Ahli so um, as you said um, playing with Stad Malen is quite a critical game for Al Ahli. They want to move forward. They want to have a bigger gap to guarantee leading in their own group. Um, that's for Al Ahli on Zamalek. On the other hand, you said uh, they've won their match today, uh, moving uh, from being down by 0-1 to winning the game and turning over the match quite uh, quite um, suddenly and also um, surprisingly enough to end the game in their favor 2-1 in an away game. It's a very precious victory for Zemanek. Now Zemanek leads the group with six points ahead. The second um, it comes um, uh, right away Ali and it comes, uh, sorry, um, uh, Al Hilal and it comes at three points. So uh, basically um, the, the entire situation for both clubs seems to be going on well for Al Ahli and Zamalek. Al Ahli has a tougher group to face. Um, he ha he's been um, confined with two um, teams from um, the, the Arabian uh, Maghreb teams which are usually a tough competitor for Egyptians. Finally Adele, obviously they are meeting in the Confederations Cup but Al Ahli and Zamalek seem to be going head to head uh, for the domestic title. Can we now say that domestic football in Egypt is back on track uh, considering uh, the league is coming back from a suspension? Well it's definitely one of the most interesting Premier Leagues in Egypt in a very long time. You know that since 2011 football in Egypt all over has been suffering a lot because of the political turmoil in the country um, there have been a one only in these four years one Premier League successfully being completed and it was in a very um, sort of what has been described here as a primitive format dividing the league into two groups to um, decrease the number of matches in the league itself now the league is back to normal. Zamalek is leading the league. Um, the points are decreasing. Al Ahli is trying to climb quite hard in a very tough competition uh, to reach the closest points differences possible uh, with Al Zamalek. Now Al Ahli has some chance to um, compete on the title, but if Al Zamalek keeps on their winning streak, it's not going to be an easy task for the Red Devils. All right, Adele, we will leave it there for now, and we will be keeping an eye on the Confederations Cup and Champions League matches this weekend. That was CCTV's Adele Mahrui joining us live from Cairo. All moving on, FIFA are yet to announce exact dates for the next election, which will take place between December this year and March 2016, but candidates are already expressing their interest in one of sport's most influential positions. One of those to announce their candidacy is Liberia FA President Musa Biliti, who claims Africa can help rebuild world football. Football's governing body FIFA is a symbol of power and wealth in world sports. But recent corruption scandals have left those within fighting to save that image. Together we go. Let's go FIFA. Sepp Blatter's announcement to stand down days after re-election was seen by many as one of the steps towards this end. And now those who feel they can step into FIFA's hot seat at a time when it's reeling from criminal investigations are already announcing their candidature. Liberia FA President Musa Biliti is among this list. Uh, we have confirmed more than five countries that have expressed willingness to 
have made commitment to us that upon the declaration of the vacancy by the executive committee, which hopefully will be done uh, in a couple of weeks uh, in uh, Zurich, our nomination will be immediately submitted. 48-year-old Biliti has run Liberian football since 2010 and is currently on a second four-year term. He believes he has the blueprint to restore FIFA's image. The executive committee has too much power. We need to reduce that power and give some back to the member association where certain decisions will be you know, transferred to the member association. Sponsorship, relationship have to be clear and open. And in the wake of corruption allegations within the beautiful game, Billy says FIFA officials must act responsibly. Members of the executive committee, officials of FIFA have to declare their assets so that you cannot accumulate unnecessary wealth while you are there. Blatter's 17-year reign has been successful as it has been controversial. The 79-year-old lauded for making the sport less Eurocentric, with his praises sung mainly by countries where he was seen to promote the game, especially in Africa, through development projects, an agenda Biliti shares. Under my administration as president of FIFA, every nation will be required to have a development project every year, and FIFA will fund that. First, he will need to win the election expected to be held between December this year and March 2016. Africa is the largest voting bloc with 54 votes, and while they often speak in one voice during elections, it is unclear whether Biliti will be a popular choice among his own. Should CAF President Issa Hayatu, however, choose to vie, Biliti says he will shelf his ambitions in support of the man who has led African football for over two decades. Celestine Carone, CCTV in Nairobi. Well, it's time for us to take a short break here on Match Point, still to come. We'll be talking rugby as Uganda qualifies for Africa Tier 1A, replacing relegated Tunisia. Welcome back. Turning to East Africa now, Uganda has gained promotion to Rugby Tier 1A after a sublime performance in the qualifying championship today. The East African side beat Botswana 59-10 on the final day of the championships. Uh, Uganda came into the final game assured that nothing but victory would guarantee promotion and it took the hosts just eight minutes to register their first points. Michael Wokorach crossed the white line for one of his three tries on the day. Botswana had no answer to Uganda's assault as points continued to rein in with ease. Three more tries in the second half ensured that the hosts ran out winners. Madagascar took second place in the 16th championship that saw Mauritius relegated to Tier 1C. An easy champion. David, we worked hard for it. Man. We worked hard for every point we got. Uh, we played as a team. That's why it looks easy on the eye. But it wasn't easy. We, we put in our hard shift. We've been training for a long time. Exactly. But in the end, it was teamwork that brought it through. Well, staying in the region, Kenya's build-up to the 2016 Olympics qualifiers in Rugby Sevens is in limbo after the team threatened to boycott training, which is set to resume on Monday. The team has complained of unpaid salaries, claiming the Kenya Rugby Union owes them up to three months' dues, as well as a poor working environment for the technical bench. Kenya finished 13th in the recent World Rugby Series and are favourites to earn the second African spot for Rio 2016, but without good preparations, they may find the going tough in the November qualifiers. Last year, South African Paul True quit at uh, his post as Kenya 7's coach, uh, coach, citing unwillingness from the union to work towards the set vision which saw him join the side. Now his compatriots Vuyo Zanka and Graham Bentz, who, started, who stayed behind, find themselves in a similar situation. The two have reiterated their commitment to working in Kenya should all their grievances be addressed. We are undertaking now a, a very massive challenge in terms of qualifying for Olympics. Within those qualifications, we'll, uh, we'll need to play in the World Series, which is another one. So there's a lot of things that are happening that um, 
that have been neglected. So when we finished 13th uh, this year, a lot of people asked why. And we simply said, but there is no base to work from. We all believe, actually, in the dream that we've, we've undertaken, which was to qualify for Olympics and actually push to medal at the Olympics. So as we're sitting here right here, we all believe that dream will never die. Now, India has begun a five-match tour of Zimbabwe, including three ODIs and two T20 matches over the next 10 days. India's visit marks the start of a busy cricket season for the Southern African country, which is due to host three more tours in the coming months. Farai Mokutuya now reports. A disappointing World Cup and a recent whitewash in Pakistan have left the national team facing tough questions. A lot of people are saying, right, what, what are we doing about the team? How do we fix it? How do we make them better? Uh, the challenge is that you don't fix a team unless you're playing cricket. The India tour gives Zimbabwe an opportunity to start playing cricket again and against quality opposition. And the good news is there's more to come. New Zealand, Pakistan and the West Indies are all set to tour Zimbabwe in quick succession before the country leaves for Bangladesh. Now these may not be test tours, but they provide Zimbabwe with crucial game time and also opportunities to pick up points for qualification for the World Cup and ICC Champions Trophy. This will also bring in television rights revenue, which can be used to replenish the cricket union's coffers. The current opponent, India, is smarting from a serious defeat against Bangladesh. We're not taking Zimbabwe lightly here. Yeah? Uh, we are respecting them, respecting their cricket and looking forward to play good cricket. Bangladesh uh, is a pass now for us. Uh, we are thinking in present moon, pre present series and uh, our, our plan will be to back our strengths, back our game rather than uh, rather than looking on Z Zimbabwe's strengths. Our plan will be to play on our strengths. India has made changes to that losing team, bringing in new faces in what some have called the second string side. It increases Zimbabwe's chances of winning, but it could also be a double-edged sword. The scorecard doesn't say Zimbabwe beat India and then in brackets India and B team. Zimbabwe beat India, period. So I'm looking at it as a cup half, empty, half full and saying, guys, send whatever team you want, send a D team. As long as we walk away with this with a 3-0 victory, then that's kudos to us. We get ranking points. The challenge for Zimbabwe is going to be that now people are looking at this and going, well, if you're any worth your salt as an international team, uh, you're now playing against an Indian B team uh, whose A team just lost to Bangladesh. Now you've traveled to Zimbabwe with a B team. Zimbabwe can't walk away with anything less than a 2-1 victory. The opening ODI match on Friday went down to the last ball and Zimbabwe lost by just four runs. They will try to level the series on Sunday. Farai Makutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Well, let's take another quick break here on Match Point, but there's plenty more still to come, including... Senegalese traditional wrestlers hold light training sessions during Ramadan. Now, the Muslim holy month of Ramadan is now in its final stretch, meaning many big sports events in Senegal are set for resumption. But for professional wrestlers, it's narrowed down to juggling their faith with the requirements of the sport. Sadiq Shaban now reports. Known popularly as Lamb in the local wall of language, wrestling is a national sport in Senegal and commands a big interest across the nation but not during the holy month of Ramadan. Wrestling venues are empty and the fans are missing. In fact, only young boys could be seen wrestling, helping to keep the momentum going during its current break. But for professional wrestlers, the Atlantic Ocean provides the first point of call after breaking their fast early in the evening as they all training for the upcoming matches. 
Because of Ramadan, we have been forced to reduce our training by up to 70 percent, as there are no competitions. That is why there are few people training here today, otherwise there would have been 30 to 40 wrestlers. As they pace about during the training, these wrestlers combine religion and love for the sport in a delicate balance. We respect wrestling, it's our cultural sport, but our Islamic religion is more important than wrestling. We have been training and competing for the whole year, but for this one month of Ramadan, we have no choice but to fast. But fasting during the month of Ramadan comes with a price they must pay for immediately they resume competition. During this period, a lot of wrestlers lose weight because of fasting Ramadan. Some of us will therefore compete in lower weight divisions as we make our way back to our previous wrestling categories. Ramadan or no Ramadan, they say a professional wrestler must show the strength of physical, mental and spiritual character to be deserving of the title. A lot of sporting activities have been suspended in the predominantly Muslim country of Senegal and for professional wrestlers eyeing their matches after this period, they are forced to train lightly and after Ramadan hours. Sadiq Shaban, CCTV, Dakar. All right, turning to Egypt now, a club by the name of Wadi Degla established its first women's team back in 2007. Since then, the club has quickly risen to become Egyptian champions with no significant competitor, even from top clubs like Al Ahli and Zamalek. The club has become a model in developing women's football in the country, as Adele El Mahroui now reports. Heavyweight football clubs in Egypt don't have women's team. Women football is not very popular since its inception in the 90s. But Wadi Degla wanted to change this perception. Women's football is not getting enough attention in Egypt. However, Wadi Degla started putting it into consideration. In 2007, we established the team. In our first season, we won the league's title. We held training camp nationally and internationally. We started in developing teaching skills beyond football. The club began by forming a senior team and recruiting young players at the same time to join the juniors. Schools were created to develop their talent and even educate them. The sport is not just about skill, socially and culturally, these girls must become prepared. One day they'll have their own families. If they don't believe in the sport, their daughters might not get the chance to play sports. There are limited disciplines which women can participate in Egypt, mostly because of social restrictions. So the team broke many barriers to prove that with limited resources, women football can develop. There's no support from football associations to the club. No efforts are being made to make women football flourish in this country. Our team does not need such support, but there are many other clubs that need the country's support. We need a strong league, and this will be the foundation of a strong national team. In just eight years, Wadi Degla won seven league and six national cup titles. 14 to 16 players of the Egyptian women national team are from the club. The Egyptian Football Association says it supports women teams, but these statements have never been translated into effective actions. The national team is just qualified for its first international competition, the All-African Games. All of this is mainly with the support of just one club. But Egypt needs many clubs like Wadi Degla to become a regional champion in women's football. Adel Mahroui, CCTV, Cairo. Ice hockey now. On the 27th of June, Andong Song became the first Chinese player drafted into the NHL when the New York Islanders selected him in the sixth round. The 18-year-old defenseman from Beijing has been working out with other Islanders' prospects during the team's minicamp. The camp lasts five days with three, three days of training and two scrimmages. The first scrimmage took place on Wednesday at the Barclays Center, which attracted over 6,000 fans. As Song continues mastering the game with the Islanders, he hopes to represent his country in the Olympic Games in 2022, which the IOC is yet to decide as hosts whether the Chinese capital or Almaty in Kazakhstan will host. The first player of Asian descent to play in the NHL was Larry Kuang, the China Clipper, when he made his debut for the New York Rangers in 1948.
you know, Chinese hockey's on the rise, and uh, you know we're we're at a lower division right now. But hopefully, in the next few years, we'll keep moving up, and then uh, hopefully, uh, if we get the get to host the 2020-2022 Olympics, you know, we'll be ready. Well, now turning to stories of players moving to China, this week it emerged that Ghana captain Asamoah Gyan was the latest big name signing to join the Chinese Super League. The 29-year-old is set to be unveiled this week and joins some big names from the continent such as Didier Drogba, uh, Demba Ba, Seydou Keita and Frederick Canute to make a shift the shift to club football in China. Most players turn out for a season or two, but a number of African players have gone on to enjoy long careers in China. So for this week's edition of the Matchpoint Top 5, uh, we look at the highest number of appearances by African players in the China Super League. At number five is Christopher Katongo. In 2011, the iconic Zambia captain joined Super League side Henan Construction, becoming the third Zambian to join the Chinese Football League. During his two years there, Katongo made 42 appearances for the side, and it was during his time there that he captained Zambia to victory at the 2012 Africa Cup of Nations. Number four on our list is Yakubu Ayegbeni. The 32-year-old is the only super eagle on our list, despite the fact that most African signings in history to China come from Nigeria. In 2012, Yakubu joined Guangzhou RNF from Blackburn Rovers in England on an initial three-year deal. He only spent two years in China, but the striker made 43 appearances for the team, scoring 24 goals in the process. 31-year-old Ghanaian Ransford Addo currently plays for Wuhan Zhao and is third on our list, having played at two clubs in China. Not necessarily the most well-known Ghanaian player, Addo moved to the Super League in 2012 to join Shanghai East Asia. He made 58 appearances for the club despite going on loan several times and made the move to Wuhan in January this year. David Claude Angan from Côte d'Ivoire is second on our list of African players in the Chinese Super League, ranked by appearances. The sixth Ivorian to move to the league moved from Norwegian side Molde to Hangzhou Greentown in 2013. The striker has made 68 appearances with the side and could enjoy plenty more considering he's just 27 years old and his contract with the team runs to 2016. And the top player on our list is Zambian James Chamanga. The centre forward has made 131 appearances at two clubs in the Super League, the Dalian Shide and the Liaoning Wu Wing. Since moving to China in 2008, he's become one of the most capped players in the league and currently stands at fifth overall of appearances by foreigners in the Super League. Well, that does it for this week's edition of Match Point. Do join us again next week. You can, as always, reach us with your feedback. Our email address is matchpoint at cctv.com. You can also visit our Facebook page and drop a comment there, CCTV Africa. Our Twitter handle is at CCTV News Africa. Thanks for watching once again. We leave you now with our move of the week, which comes from the Women's World Cup final in Vancouver, where the United States defeated Japan 5-2 and that emphatic goal from Carly Lloyd.